are you, Lord? Our hearts need you. Our spirits strongly strive to connect with you, your word, everything about you, and all that you would fill us with today. Father, I, that's our heart cry to you. In Jesus' name, oh, praise the Lord. Thank you. You guys can be seated. Sit down if you can. Yeah, praise the Lord. Yeah, our hearts cry out for the Lord. That's just a spirit cry. That's what that boils down to. And we are seeking the Lord and his word for us and his encouragement to our lives. These are some really tough days, and I know I don't have to say that to you or to anybody. Uh, my goodness, it's just been, it's just, a, it's just a tough time, very tough, especially for those of us that love the Lord and, and, uh, and follow him and want to please him, and we're looking for his purpose and his direction. One of the things that I've been sharing with you for the past, well, really even, um, even since January, uh, I've been talking about uh, end time things, you know, the rapture and uh, road signs on the way and just all kind of things about what the scripture says about these days that we're living in. Because uh, it's not difficult to see, for anyone to see, especially if you know anything about prophecy at all. If you've ever heard a sermon about prophecy, uh, it's not, it's not difficult to see what's going on all around us because it's so plain and it's so open. And so I've just been compelled to try to get in here and, uh, and encourage us in what God, that God's in control, first of all. He certainly is. He's written about the times we're living in since uh, 1,500 years before Jesus ever stepped on the earth. So that's about 3,500 years ago. He told us that all these things would begin to happen. And while he was here on earth, he told us over and over and over, this is what you look for. This is how you'll know. And when you see these things begin to happen, this is where we are. And so the word certainly has told us repeatedly, uh, pay attention. I don't think any of us could, could, could ever leave here saying we haven't been warned, you know, for Thousands of years, well, it hadn't been printed by a print in the past thousands of years, but it's been the best-selling book ever. The best-selling book, the Bible, ever, has told us thousands of times what to look for and what to be aware of and so forth. And so I started uh, a, this series in Best Day Ever to uh, tell you that uh, these days that, we in, that we're in now are like the torture chamber that these are not the best days that we're going to have, that the best day ever is going to be when Jesus returns to take us with him to heaven, an event that we call the rapture, uh, the great snatching up, the taking away, and that when that happens, he's going to take us home to heaven, back to heaven, and... Uh, and all of the things that Adam and Eve lost in the beginning because of their sin and their failure, he has redeemed those, including last week we covered the authority. Uh, as a matter of fact, we've been in, let me just read this passage first before I get ahead of myself because I, I want to start there and we'll move off of that. It's the one we've been jumping on to start with every time. Uh, Luke 21, this is Jesus speaking, verse 25. And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and on earth distress of nations with perplexity. Check all that. Check, check, check. The sea and the waves roaring. Yeah, restless, unstable nations and people upset and in crisis. Check. Men's hearts failing them for fear, terrorism on this earth and the expectation of what's going to happen on this earth that's even worse than happening now. And what will they do next? Those kind of things. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud, which is the rapture with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads because your redemption draws nigh. So Jesus is telling us uh, it's time to focus on God. Don't let yourself become distracted because the world will distract you and if it can distract you, then it's going to discourage you. So don't let the earth and don't let the world and don't let the people of the world and don't let the enemy of your soul drag your head down so that you no longer focus on Christ, but you focus on what's around you and you get discouraged and you get distracted. Keep 
focus on Christ because your redemption is right around the corner. And to redeem, and I know you've heard this uh, several times, but just bear with me. Uh, to be redeemed means you've been bought back. Uh, you, you cannot redeem something that is not yours to start with. Now, you can purchase it, but you can't redeem it because to re the word redeem means to buy it back. Like you had it at one time, you owned it, it was yours, and then you lost it, and someone else has it, and now you have to buy it back from them. So you've really purchased it twice, once when you made it, once when you bought it back. So that's what's happening. We were created by God. Adam and Eve were put in a garden, a wonderful garden, born with everything, but they lost it all when they sinned, and they handed over all of that to the enemy. And in this series, we've been looking at five things that they lost. And so far, we've seen three of them. Today's number four. We have number five next week. But so far, we've seen that they lost their perfect bodies. They had bodies that were perfect in creation, and they would be exactly the same today, right now at this moment, as they were at the moment they were created had they not sinned. But when they sinned, those bodies begin to die, and they become corrupt, and they, and they perish after a period of time. Well, we're going to get perfect bodies back when Jesus comes back because Jesus has redeemed our bodies. They lost pleasure. Now, this is one of the things that I, I really want us all to grab onto because this is just a powerful word right here. I mean, this is a, this is a tremendous motivator, I, I believe. Just think of, all right, Adam and Eve were created in the Garden of Eden. Eden means delight. God created them perfectly, perfect senses, perfect uh, nerves, functions, uh, 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 skin, uh, ways to experience their environment and, and, and each other and every way. Nothing was shorted. There was no numbness. There was no you know, mental deals going on. I mean, it was perfect. And he put them in a garden that was called delight, Pleasureville, man. And he said, all right, here's what you do. I got, I got a word to say to you. Uh, don't eat that tree, uh, that tree in the middle, because if you do, you're going to die. And then um, uh, be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> Replenish the earth. Fill the earth and subdue it and take dominion over it. That's it. More rules? No, nope. no, nope. that's it. Just have fun. And when they sinned, of course, they brought a curse that took all of that away and pain began in mankind. This is where suffering comes from. This is where pain entered into our, uh, into our vocabulary. The arthritis, the you know, knee replacements, the uh, uh, surgeries, the diseases, the sicknesses, the, the emotional failures, the psychological failures, the stress, anxiety, all of that entered when we lost our pleasure. But just think of any pleasurable thing you can think of. I mean, anything, anything that, you, that gives you pleasure, that makes you smile, that gives you a tingle, that makes you happy, that you look forward to, that's wonderful to think about. I mean, just anything. And it's all gonna be there when we get back to heaven with Jesus because he has redeemed our pleasure. And then th number three from last week, uh, our authority. Now, most of the songs that we sang today and most of the songs that we sing almost any praise and worship time are songs about authority, about how Jesus has authority and that we are under his authority and with his authority, we can break every stronghold, we can defeat every enemy, uh, we can do great and miraculous things because of the authority that Jesus Christ has over everything and we, because we belong to him, have some of that authority. Now, I call it a limited authority, and I know, you know, if, if there was some preacher, you know, watching right now that was a stickler for theology, he'd probably turn a backflip and say, you're so, yeah, you're wrong, man. But you know what I'm saying. We, we don't have all of the authority that we once had. 
At one time, we had authority over physical things. We could move that chair with a, with a thought. We could, you know, we could rearrange things. We could put things, we, could, we just had complete authority. Physical, spiritual, emotional. Now we have some spiritual authority, but the spiritual authority we have is through him. It's his Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. It's not like we have it ourselves and we're like little gods walking around here. No, it, our authority filters through him. So we've got some, but we don't have all of it. And, and we, have a, we have a foreshadowing of it or a taste of it. But when Jesus comes, we're going to get all of our authority back that we lost when Adam and Eve sinned. I mean, gee, look, Jesus came to this earth. Jesus fought the enemy on this earth. Jesus didn't yield to any of his schemes or any of his shortcuts. Jesus said, I'm going to come and I'm going to die and I'm going to redeem you. And that's exactly what he did. And three days later, he went to heaven, sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat of, in heaven and became the first fruits of them that slept. He bought us back. He purchased us again. Right, in full. Satan didn't give us back. He tried to, but Jesus didn't fall for that. You remember? These are the kingdoms of the world. If you'll just fall down and worship me, I'll give you this. It's mine, you know. I got it. Adam and Eve gave it to me, is what he said. So it's mine, and I can give it to whoever I want to. And I'll give it to you if you'll just fall down and worship me. You don't even have to go to the cross. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to get beaten beyond imagination. You don't have to get roughed up and killed, die, all that. Come on, man, let me just give it to you. You said, no, I, 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 I'm going to die for it. <laughs> you know, I think I'll just die for it. And he did, and, he gave, and so this is why we get all of this stuff back. When he comes, he brings it with him. Now, here's what Genesis 3, well, let me, let me read this. This week, we're going to talk about our redeemed home. We're going to get our home back. And I'm going to just read what I wrote in, in my handout to you. If you have that handout, this is the first paragraph up at the top. And by the way, let me just say this. Any of you guys, we have quite a few that, that watch, and you don't obviously get to come in here and pick up one of these. And uh, I do them for every message. And um, some of them are better than others, but I think they're all worth having. But anyway, anyway, all you have to do is send us your email address. Uh, message it on Facebook or uh, send it uh, to our website. We have, a, we have some email on our website. Anyway, yeah, yeah contact us and, and, and the contact us in our, on our website. And we'll send it to you every week before the message. And you'll, you'll have it when we start talking about it when we read it. All right, let me just read it. 6,000 years ago, Adam and Eve got kicked out of the house. They broke the rules, they sinned. I know this may sound strange, but because of that, you have never really been home. When you leave this service and you go to that place that you call home, it's not really home, it's temporary housing. Your true home is in heaven with God. God wanted to live with mankind, so he created us and placed us in the garden of paradise. The reason we know that he wanted to live with us is simple to see. When he created Adam and Eve, he lived with them. When we go to heaven, we're going to live with Jesus forever. God wants to live with us in paradise, but we have lost our housing privileges. When Jesus comes with our redeemed housing arrangements, he's going to take us home for real. Now, see, we have experienced on this earth a temporary situation. What does the Bible say? We're, we're strangers and pilgrims in this world. How many of you are feeling more like strangers and pilgrims now than you've ever felt before? You look at How many of you now are looking at what's going on in this world around us at this moment and saying, I feel more like a stranger in this world than I ever have? I feel like a pilgrim. Jesus, come and get me and take me home. Yeah, and it, and it just and and it gets worse. The it, your your senses get heightened to that that you're just passing through. Well, the reason why is because you are, and you have never really. Now think about this. You have never really experienced home yet. I mean, we've had some delightful times. We all like to go back home from time. I mean, all of that. We, our, but we have never really experienced 
the fulfillment of home in our life, and it won't happen until Jesus takes us back. Because look, here's what happened. This is Genesis 3. This is what happened to Adam and Eve when they fell concerning our home, okay? Uh, then, this verse 20, uh, three, chapter 3, verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil, And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Now, now, let me just explain what that means. What that means, what Jesus is saying there, or God is saying is, if they, now that they've eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they know know good and evil. And if we don't stop them and they eat of the tree of life, they're going to live forever like that. In other words, there, there, there can't be any redemption for them. If they eat of that tree of life, they're going to they're remain in the state, in the fallen state that they are in forever. So I've got to stop them from eating so that we can redeem them. And so what did God do? There, verse 23, therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man... And he placed cherubim, which are angels, at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard to the tree of, every way to the tree of life. So God made sure now that they weren't going to be able to get back there and 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 never be able to be redeemed. Thank the Lord. He stopped all of that mess. And John 14. Is an, a, is an explicit text that tells us where Jesus is today, what he's doing, and the fact that he's going to come back after us. The, uh, my favorite passage, beginning in verse one, let not your heart be troubled. This is Jesus talking. Let, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it weren't so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you might be also. And the reason I bring this up is because I want you to know that that language that John is using, that explicit language John is using is uh, wedding language. Uh, Jews, when, when a Jewish person heard that I'm going home to prepare a place for you. And when I get the place ready, I'm coming back so that I can receive you to where I am. They all understood what John was saying. John was saying like we do in a a wedding. It's It's the tradition that we have in the wedding. And when they heard it, they heard... Uh, I, I, I'm going to prepare a mansion for you at daddy's house. At daddy's house, there are lots of mansions. And when I get it ready, then I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you and I'm going to take you where, where I've built the mansion so that you and I can be there forever. So what happens when Jesus comes back? We go home We go to the place that Jesus has built for us. This wonderful, marvelous mansion in the new Jerusalem of God that comes down out of heaven. Let me share with you three realities concerning the Father's house. All right, Jesus is at the Father's house. He's building us a mansion. It's going, to be in the, it's going to be in the New Jerusalem. That's where he is right now. In the New Jerusalem, Jesus is right there. He's building on some mansions. That's where you're going to live. That's where your mansion is going to be, in the New Jerusalem. Now, all right, so let me give you three realities concerning the Father's house. Number one, the Father's house is a real physical place, and it is the ultimate paradise. The Father's house is not a cloud. It's not a a, a cosmic dust. It's not some warm, fuzzy psychological suggestion. The Father's house is a real place. Heaven is a real physical place. A place that you can touch. A place that you can feel. A place that, 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 that... beings exist in, that physical structures exist in. 
Revelation 21, I'm about to read, is a description of where Jesus is right now and where your house in your mansion is going to be. And in Revelation 21, beginning at, uh, let's see, beginning at verse 9. Let me see here. I get these, these, these pages. Here we go. Here it is. Then one, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, that happened earlier in the book, came to me and talked with me. So this angel's pulling double duty, all right? This angel had the bowls and poured out the plagues, but also now he, it's the same angel that comes, talks to John. This is at the end of the book. There are only 22 chapters. This is the, this is the next to the last chapter. Uh, it came to him and talked with me saying, come and I'll show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me the great city the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. Now, the reason he showed him the great city coming down out of heaven is because that's where we live. We're not there, right? We're here. The bride lives in those mansions in that city. So the reason he saw the city is because there weren't any of us in it to see at that time. So he just showed him the city where we were coming down. And so anyway, let's go on. Hopefully, y'all got, does that make sense to you? You understand? All right. All right. The Holy Spirit descending out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and the 12 and 12 angels at the gates, and names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So wherever your mansion is in the New Jerusalem, it's gonna be, uh, you're gonna enter at a gate somewhere. All right, so you give an address. You say, no, come on down, come down to the Judah gate. Yeah, when you get to the Judah gate, come on in, my mansion's right up the street. Or go down to the Reuben's, uh, uh, Reuben's uh, gate. Or go down to the uh, Judah gate. Or whatever gate it is, because every gate is named after one of the tribes of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations. Now I don't know if that means 12 foundations stacked on top of each other or 12 foundations spaced along the way that the city rests on. I don't know which one of those it is, but it has 12 foundations, and they're named after the apostles. So you say, well, go down to John Foundation and turn into Simeon Gate, and there's my mansion right there. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just thinking. Now, the, and, and he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Uh, that's about 1,380 miles. Uh, you can just round it up to 1,400 if you want to. Its length, so it's 1,400 miles that way, 1,400 miles that way. You get out there, 1,400 miles that way, 1,400 miles that way, and 1,400 miles that way. It's a 1,400-mile cube is what it is. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits. A cubit's 18 inches. A man's cubit, an angel's cubit would be a little different, but he measured it by a man's cubit. Look what he says, according to the measure of man. Okay, so he just wanted you to know, hey, I didn't use angel cubits on you. All right, skip down to verse 21. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Boy, I love that line. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and their honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. Now, I didn't put this parenthesis. This, was, this is part of the word. There shall be no night there. <laughs> so the gates are never going to be shut, are they? 
They're only open during the day, but there's no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, but there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's the end of chapter 21. Here's chapter 22, first couple of three, couple of three verses. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. I'm sorry, I've been deceiving you. It's not banana pudding flowing in the river of life. It's clear water. But don't worry, there'll be some banana pudding somewhere. Uh, and in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Now, his servants are the angels. We're not servants, we're sons. We're his sons, and they serve us also. It's a, it, heaven is beautiful beyond description. And it's eternal, which means you go in and you never have to leave. Kind of like the, uh, this will this will be one of those uh, historical uh, timing datings, kind of like the Hotel California, you remember? Uh, you can check in, but you can't check out, right? <laughs> right? Eagles, middle 70s, okay, all right, never mind. Never mind, I got you, I got you. <laughs> According to, according to, to um, recent census rec uh, records, the average American moves every four years. Well, when you get to heaven, you won't ever move anymore. You know what I believe about your mansion? I believe that your mansion is custom built for you. In other words, as individual as you are, our mansions are gonna be that individual. And the reason I say that is because God didn't create cook or co cookie cutter people, right? We're all different. So God's not going to create cookie cutter mansions in heaven. In other words, it's not going to be like row houses where every mansion looks the same and everybody gets the same. I think when you walk into your mansion that everything about your mansion is going to just suit you perfectly. I think every paint on the wall, every, th every design of the, of the crown and, and the woodwork and everything about it, I think it's going to be your perfect taste. You couldn't, you couldn't be happier with the decor of your mansion because God knows you. God, and that's how much he loves you. And he's building that place just perfectly for you. I don't know how your home is, and I don't mean to insult your home. I hope every one of you have the most beautiful homes in the world. But may I say to you that your home you live in now is rubbish compared to the mansion that Jesus is building for you, and, he is, and we're going to get to stay there, and every believer is going to have one with no payments, no upkeep, no insurance, no, bless God, taxes. Don't even have to have a security system, no pest control, or utility bills. Glory to God, those people in Texas would love to hear that, man. Those people got nine, ten thousand, seventeen thousand dollar electric bills. Is that crazy? Mm. Number two, reality. My father's house is a place where the bride becomes the wife of Christ. Now, you, you remember I spoke a moment ago about John using wedding language. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'm going to come back, take you where I am. They may be also. All right. What, what John was saying to all the Jewish people that heard that was what the Jews do for their wedding custom. Now, this perfectly describes our life with the Lord and our future with him. And I'm gonna read it to you. I wrote it down so I could read it to you because if I try to preach it to you, it's gonna take about an hour to do it. I hope I can read it in just a few minutes, all right? Can you hang on? Are you interested in this? All right, let me show you what's gonna happen now. The bride of Christ, you know, the church is the bride of Christ. Jesus is called the bridegroom we know there's a marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19. 
the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's a big celebration at the end of a wedding where the, where the bride of Christ and the bridegroom have been married to each other. And of course, this is a metaphor. Of course, this is symbolic. Of course, this is showing us how close we are going to be with Jesus. We're going to be just enmeshed. And I'm sure he used the, the wedding because, I mean, uh, marriage is the closest of all and it's the most intimate of all human relationships. You can't get more intimate than a marriage. And so Jesus said, I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to be so, we're going to be so involved with each other. We're going to be married. I mean, it's like a wedding and I'm the bridegroom and you're the bride. Man, we just have to get over that. All right. So here we go. All right. In Jesus day, when a young man came of age to seek, to seek a bride, he would send out a trusted servant or a friend. This representative would carry in his heart the traits and the qualities that were sought by his master. This is, by the way, if you want to see this lived out, turn to Genesis 24 and read about what Abraham did for his son Isaac. Abraham sent his most trusted servant, Eliezer, to find Isaac a bride. And Eliezer found beautiful Rebecca, a lifelong bride and wonderful, precious. All right, that's what it's talking about. The servant who, would, who never spoke of himself would carry with him gifts from the bridegroom with which to win the bride. Upon completion of the search and assurance from the prospective bride that she would be willing to wed the bridegroom the servant reports home to the bridegroom and his father. I have found a young lady that I believe to be acceptable and pleasing. The bridegroom would quickly come to meet the woman that would hopefully become his bride. During a brief initial meeting with the bride, the groom would evaluate her acceptability. And if he found her pleasing, I know that's hate speech nowadays. If he found her pleasing, that's some more hate speech, he would go into negotiation with her father. In Eastern culture, a daughter was a servant. To lose her was to lose a servant. So daughters had to be paid for. To lose her was to lose a valued worker in the home. All right, the typical price for a bride was 30 pieces of silver. Does that, does that ring in any in your brain? Just keep that in your mind. Keep that in your mind. The, the normal price of a bride, a woman, was 30 pieces of silver. If you wanted a man, it was 50 pieces of silver. So there's a distinction. All right, just keep that in mind. Upon completion of the contract with her father, the groom would approach his bride. Proper assurances were given that the process was complete and he could now ask her to be his wife. If she agreed, a ring, or most often a written document was given, assuring her that he would be faithful to come back for her and marry her. Up until the document was given, listen to this, up until the document was given, negotiations could be broken off at any time. After the written document was given, the wedding was in process and the couple was looked at as husband and wife. This binding agreement was sealed by the sharing of a cup of wine between the bride and the groom. You may wonder the need for such a procedure. The groom must now leave and prepare a place, a proper home for his bride. This could be a quite lengthy matter. The groom would report home and announce that all was ready for the next level of preparation. He must build an appropriate home for his new bride, typically a one-year process. Since dad had the wisdom of family life, his approval would be mandatory before the son could go after his bride. Dad would occasionally inspect the building progress, and when all was in place, he would give the thumbs up to go retrieve the bride. This is why Jesus said in Mark 13 that he didn't even know when he was going to come back. Only my father. The angels don't know. I don't know. Only daddy knows. You know why? Because daddy's got to give approval before he can go back. In the absence of the groom, 
the bride would begin a hasty but thorough preparation. All right, this is us now. Our bridegroom's back in heaven. He's talking to daddy. What are we supposed to be doing? In the absence of the groom, the bride would make a hasty but thorough preparation. She had no idea when he would return, but must always be ready. Her dress must be made, bridesmaids secured, usually her sisters, lamps, oil, and wicks located and prepared, Every passing day brought more anticipation and excitement. At any moment, they could hear the announcement, the bridegroom is coming. Back at home, dad would give the nod of approval to his son and off he would go. The son wouldn't, wouldn't want to arrive in an unimpressive manner, so he would mount his best steed and follow the shout of the servant announcing, the bridegroom is coming. This clamorous parade usually happened at night. It added to the mystique. The father of the bride, having already been paid off, you remember the price has already been paid. She's already, she already belongs to the bridegroom. Her father, the father of the bride, having been paid off, added to the pageantry by hiding himself and allowing the bride to be stolen away. As the bridegroom whisked away his betrothed, the bridesmaids paraded through the streets laughing and weeping and waving their lanterns. This is a real celebration. The bridegroom has been faithful to his promise. He's taken the bride and they're on their way home. Back at father's house, an unusual crowd has gathered for the festivities. Dad has called in all of his married friends to witness the ceremony and prepare the post-wedding feast. That's the marriage supper. Following the ceremony, the bride and groom would retire to their quarters to spend seven uninterrupted days together. At the end of seven days, the now duly married couple would emerge and enjoy with the friends of the bridegroom the wonderful banquet feast they had prepared. What does this say to us? Well, I just wrote it down for myself, but you can put your name in here or your event. One day the Holy Spirit was dispatched from heaven seeking a bride for Christ. And he came to the back row of a simple choir loft at a small country church in Meridian, Mississippi. told me about Jesus and exposed me to all, all the wonderful gifts that would be mine. He then went back to Jesus and said, I found a bride that I think you'll be pleased with. Jesus came and knocked on my heart's door and I opened it and he came in and we fellowship together. He then went to my father, the devil, and paid the price for me he bought me back. Interestingly, Jesus was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a woman, because he was purchasing a bride. He came back and he gave me a document, my Bible, that, that promised that he would return for me. And each time I partake of the Lord's Supper, I remember his promise to me. Over a cup of wine at the Last Supper, Jesus told his disciples that our marriage covenant is sealed with his blood and he promised us that I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And then Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if, it, if that wasn't so, I would have told you. But I'm going to prepare a place. And if I go and prepare a place, I'm going to come back and take you 
to where I am so that we can be there forever. Now, the sad part of the story is that, that he's not here now. But do you know where he is? He's, he's with his father. And, he, and, he, and he's, building, he's building me a mansion. He's building us a place. And his father could have just this moment walked out and looked at that mansion and said, you know, boy, that's looking really good. I think maybe just a tiny little dot down in here or so. It won't be long, son. It won't be long. Then you can go get her. And he might be right at that moment just about ready to say, go get him, son. When is he coming? As soon as, the, as, soon as my mansion's finished. As soon as his dad says, go get him, son. And by the time Jesus gets his impressive white horse that the book of Revelation says he'll be riding, a trumpet will sound, and the archangel will shout, the bridegroom is coming. I don't know what he'll shout. Come up here. I think he'll probably shout, the bridegroom is coming. My old father, the devil, who's been paid off I no longer belong to him. I have been redeemed. We'll have to hide and watch Jesus steal me away like a thief in the night. Now here's the big question. How prepared is Jesus going to find me? Will I be in a beautiful wedding garment or some tattered rags? Will my lamp be properly prepared? Will I have oil in my lamp and my wick properly trimmed? Will I be ready? In a wedding, if you walked in and the groom was nicely dressed and clean and neat and the bride came in with curlers in her hair, dressed in filthy blue jeans and a faded t-shirt, what would you think? You would probably say, I wonder if she really loves him. I can tell you one thing I'll never forget when, the, when I saw Tanya when she stepped out of that room the night we got married. I don't know how long you'd been there all afternoon, I'm sure. And because she wanted everything to be perfect. She wanted to look more beautiful than she had ever looked in her entire life. And you did. I was shaking so bad, I don't know. I, I, it, was the, it was the gravity of the moment. It was like, whew, man, I couldn't even have to hold the unity candle with two hands. Like that. But you, and you still are beautiful. She's always immaculate. Are we going to be ready? Our readiness reflects our love. Do we, want to, do we want Jesus to come back and get us with curlers in our hair and old rag muffin flip-flops on? Or do we want to be ready for his return? See, we have a responsibility too. His responsibility is go build a mansion, a place for us. Our responsibility is to be ready when he comes. I told you there are three realities. One is it's a real place. It's ultimate paradise. Two is, it's a place where the wedding happens. The bride becomes the wife of Christ. And here's the third one. It's just, I'm just going to mention it. Heaven is home. The third reality of the Father's house is that it's home. I know some people, and I know you do, too, that feel lonely in this world we're in right now. With all kinds of people around them, they're still lonely. They feel unloved. They feel disrespected. Nobody cares for me. Nobody wants me. They feel like a failure. But when Jesus comes and takes us home, we are going to go home. And when we get there, we will never be unloved again. We will never be lonely again. 
we will never sense desperation that we're just not where we should be. We will be home and we will sense it and we will feel it and it will be a, a, a peace and a relief in our life because this world is not our home. We are just temporarily passing through here. We're pilgrims and strangers in this land and that's why it feels so crazy right now because it's not our home. We got a greater home than this, and it's coming when Jesus comes. No wonder the scripture said that our prayer should be, Come quickly, Lord. All right, let's bow our heads.